As always, we set out at dawn. Uncle Ken silently pulled on his smelly overalls, leading me half asleep out of the apartment and down to Gloucester Harbor. He'd trudged past over-eager tourists, finely manicured gardens, and the beginnings of farmer market stalls, with a single-minded focus. In his head, Uncle Ken was a 19th century sailor. He wasn't going to let anything change his mind. We walked out to where his little fishing boat was moored and boarded the ancient vessel. Then we waited in the harbor until Uncle Ken's large frame hunched over the center console of the small craft until the sun lit the clouds enough that he could pretend to read them. I sat on the bench that ran across the stern of the craft. My knees pulled up to my chest, a bright yellow windbreaker keeping out the cold gusts of the salty ocean air. I had started helping him with the crab traps in the summer after my mother passed away. The man had taken me in after her long battle with lung cancer, but that didn't mean that he was going to make any adjustments to his lifestyle. To say that I hated it would be both oversimplistic and an understatement. I gazed into the water, and that day it was as clear as glass. Silver bodies of small fish were swimming just below the surface, and every so often a dark silhouette would emerge from the shadows of the seafloor. At a particularly strong gust of wind, I pulled my knees into my coat. Every morning I would need to sit there silently for about ten minutes before Uncle Ken would make some grand forecast of today's weather, a prediction that rarely came true, and when contradicted, left him in a foul mood. I didn't understand why the man spent so much time studying the morning sky when it would never tell him anything more reliable than the weather channel, but now I felt like the action was as necessary for him as breathing. They'd let him pretend, for just ten minutes, that the world was mysterious, but not so mysterious that a clever man like himself couldn't sort it out. I looked at the pink, wispy clouds, but that didn't tell me anything interesting. Fair weather, my uncle said confidently. I looked up from the water just as a hand swatted the back of my neck. Don't sit like that, the man said. If the boat rocks, you'll fall overboard and drown. That sounded like an overreaction, but there was a reason everyone in town called him Captain Ken. We aren't moving, I mumbled, removing my legs anyway. Never trust the water, Jacob, he said, glaring as he started the engine. After a few sputtering tries, it came to life, hacking and spitting, and the acid smell of diesel flooded my sinuses. Soon we had navigated out of the harbor and into open water rumbling towards where Uncle Ken's buoys marked the location of crab traps that we'd last checked on several days prior. If you wait too long, Uncle Ken had cautioned, the crabs will start eating each other. At this point, I was 13, and I had little interest in the craft of crab catching. All I wanted was to get it over with. I really paid attention to his half-hearted attempts to teach me, and he really paid attention to my attempts to get out of going with him. And that morning, the clouds morphed from discernible shapes, to a light cover as we approached the green and yellow buoys, cut the engine, and began drifting. Uncle Ken reached his arm over the hull and scooped one aboard. Before we started, he cast a rod out, a bell fastened to the end. He rarely got a bite while we worked, him hauling the cage from the seafloor and me frantically winding the slack rope because it caused too much of a disturbance in the water. But that didn't stop him from trying. The morning brightened as one after another, the traps came up empty. The only one with any kind of catch was the fifth, with one sickly juvenile. A soupy fog rolled in as I watched Uncle Ken get more and more disappointed. We'll have to check the backups today, he said. That meant two things to me. One, that I would be late to school. And two, that we would have to run the pulley. I hated the pulley. The sound of it was like nails on a chalkboard, and it seemed to break more often than it worked. We only used it to pull in the huge cages tied to the pink and blue buoys, the ones that floated far off the coast. There, land could only be seen in the clearest days. They set off again, this time towards the horizon. I sat back on the bench, watching as the coastline sunk into the fog. Uncle Ken and I had never gone out so far in this kind of weather before, and I remember trying to force myself to trust that he knew what he was going. The moment I could no longer see the shore, 
There was a sickening burst of panic in my stomach, tense and disorienting enough that I felt physically ill and dizzy. I looked to my uncle for reassurance, but the man's face showed only vague annoyance as he glared ahead. I knew from experience that asking questions of safety made the man angry, and did little good. If anything, they egged him on to make riskier decisions, as if to punish me for doubting his skills. So I stayed silent, even as the fog thickened and the waves picked up. There's something intensely isolating about the open ocean. With no land to orient myself by, it felt like all that existed in the world was our little boat and the endless sea. The waves got worse, and the bell and the rod began to ring incessantly in the wind. I stayed silent, clutching the handrail. It'll pass, my uncle kept repeating, his voice mostly blown away by the wind. I just nodded until the fishing rod was torn from the deck, and the ringing of the bell stopped. The point at which I could have mentioned my fear had long passed, and the danger had become obvious enough to Uncle Ken. His hands were clenched around the wheel in a white-knuckled grip. All traces of casual irritation at the day's catch were gone, replaced by lines of barely suppressed panic. We climbed waves as large as rolling hills, and coasted into troughs so deep it felt as if the walls of water might swallow us. I was afraid in a distant sort of way, like my brain couldn't decide on a course of action, and was instead stuck trying wildly to process everything that was happening. Then a wave came that was too steep for even our small boat to climb. It crashed over the deck, and the last thing I saw was my uncle's horrified face as he was swept overboard. The next thing I knew, I was lying on the deck. My hand was still clutched around a rail, but the boat was still. Above me, a pale gray sky loomed, devoid of all gradient. Uncle Ken? I shouted, standing straight up with a jolt of pain, but I got no response. I hadn't expected one. The boat was empty, and I was utterly alone. Although the water was flat, flatter than I ever remember it being out this far, the fog had not lifted. If anything, it had grown thicker. I remember my head was bleeding, but it, that didn't seem important. I noticed that the engine had stalled, but that, that didn't seem important either. I don't know how long I spent lying there, slipping in and out, but by the time I could consistently keep my eyes open, I realized the wind was once again picking up. Unlike before, watching Uncle Ken struggle in the storm, this time my fear had an outlet. I needed to stand. I needed to start the engine. I needed to call for help. The first of these tasks probably took me a good five minutes. My whole body felt dazed and wobbly, and when I finally got to my feet, I found it hard to stay there. The wind was blowing in a way that I'd never felt before. It was constant and unchanging. Gusts that blew back my hair and brought tears to my eyes. Strangest of all, the boat seemed to be heading into it. Not away. I struggled to the wheel and sunk into my uncle's captain's chair. I had rarely ever been allowed to drive the boat, and even when I had, it was under strict and unyielding instruction, the kind that made learning unnecessary at best, and an obstacle at worst. All my knowledge had come from watching Uncle Ken, and as strange as it seemed, I was completely unprepared to do it on my own. There's a difference between riding the bus to school every day and driving the bus to school. It didn't matter that it was something I'd seen a hundred times. As I tried to start the engine, the actions felt foreign under my hands. The wind continued to pick up. The boat continued to drive forward. The engine wouldn't start. I squinted into the fog, hopelessly trying to find the coast. Instead, instead I saw something truly horrible. Through the fog in every direction, the water rose up like a wall. The wind I was feeling was not wind at all. The boat was gliding down a great slope of water, going ever deeper with each passing moment. I cried out then, an instructional sob of hopeless terror. I, I knew I was going to die, that I would drown at the bottom of this impossible chasm alone and helpless. The engine wouldn't start. And then I saw it. The island that was not an island. An island that was supposed to rise from the sea, but... The sea swirled and parted around the small circle of land as if it was the center of an invisible drain. I, I, I didn't look at it. Instead, I focused on the engine, opening the choke, pulling the cord, trying anything that I could as the circling craft drew closer to the sea floor. I imagine this was all a dream. It felt like one. I tried to convince myself that if I died, I'd only wake up in my bed, that I, I had nothing to worry about. 
The first time the voice called out to me, I ignored it. My fried brain unable to process it any more than an illusion. But then it came again. Louder. Jacob! The stern voice was familiar. I had avoided looking at the seafloor island, as if pretending that it wasn't there, waiting to collide with the boat. I could will it out of existence. But now I had to see it. Because standing on the false shore, surrounded by the wreckage of a hundred dead ships, was my Uncle Ken, and, and he wasn't alone. I could make out over a dozen men standing with him. They all waved to me with arms flailing as if possessed, but only Uncle Ken's voice was audible. Jacob, it cried. Help us! I flipped a final switch and the engine roared to life. Relief like I had never known surged through my body at the sound, but suddenly I had no idea what to do. There was my uncle, standing as if he was completely uninjured. If I got that close to the bottom, surely I would crash. Jacob! He called again. But this time there was something in his voice, something hungry. And the chorus of voices joined him, rattling with fervent desperation. Jacob! They screamed. Jacob! They clawed at each other mercilessly, climbing on top of the fallen as if they would allow them to get to me. We were in the kitchen. After the first time I'd gone out to get the crab traps with him. It had been a good day, Uncle Ken said as he turned on the stove. Are you going to kill them? I asked. He kept a few crabs when we went to go sell the rest. I knew that we were going to eat them, but at this point, they were still alive. I watched the poor creatures struggle as Uncle Ken lifted them up with tongs and dropped them into the pot. No point, he laughed as the water began to boil. A sound was like screaming filled the kitchen. They just drag each other down. I turned the boat away. I turned the boat away. I don't know much about driving it, but there was a pedal and a wheel, and I floored it in the direction most opposite of my uncle's screeching. His voice seemed to carry the farthest, and I could hear his pleas and then his rage for, for far longer than was natural. I don't know how that little boat made it out of that chasm. I don't remember much of it. I think the, the head injury made everything fuzzy. I think it was days, maybe, that I spent rumbling upwards. It felt like days. Eventually, the gas ran out, and I, I dreamed that I was sucked back down and devoured by the ghosts at the bottom. The next time I opened my eyes, however, there was a flashlight shining into them, and a voice telling me to stay still. There were paramedics around me as I was lifted onto a stretcher. I recognized the Coast Guard uniforms. Apparently, we'd been reported missing soon after I had missed my first class, and there had been a search party looking for us since. It really had been several days, and they were just about to call off the search when they found me right in the middle of the grid, as so if I'd come out of thin air. I babbled to them feverishly about my uncle, about the other ships and the men at the bottom of the sea. At some point, I started to apologize and rant about boiling crabs. And all this was steadily ignored by the people around me. They were uninterested in what I'd seen. And as soon as I was back in my right mind, I stopped trying to tell them about it. They moved me into a foster home inland, and I, I, I tried to forget. I tried to tell myself that it was just a dream, just a, just a way that my imagination coped with such a traumatizing event. Maybe a manifestation of my guilt and not having said anything, not having done anything before my uncle was sucked overboard. Even if I had almost convinced myself that this was the case, I never went near the ocean. Just the sight of its endless horizon would make me start to panic, start to remember the sounds of their voices. It was only years later that, as an adult, and at the repeated requests of my wife, that I returned to the water. It wasn't as if we were going swimming. It was only a Christmas fair on the boardwalk, she said. Nothing to worry about. And at first she was right. But despite my reluctance, the sounds of families milling about, craft stalls, and people laughing and drunkenly singing in the various beer gardens and niche bars, they put me at ease. It was easy for me to pretend that the waves weren't there and they put the ocean far out of my mind. The sunset 
The sky grew dark as we walked along the pier, and I was testing my resolve by casually towing closer to the thick wooden railing. When a wave far larger than any of the others crashed into the side. It wasn't big enough to be very remarkable, and certainly not enough to be dangerous. But its spray threw a light mist at us, even from across the path. When the mist hit me, a voice came with it, faint but clear, clear as the morning sea. Jacob, my uncle's broken voice said. I can't get out of the pot. Hey there, kids. It's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and thank you so much for listening to tonight's story or watching tonight's story, whichever one you happen to do. I also want to tell you, if you guys like stories, then you should always check out the description down below. In the description, there's a couple different places you can always go to if you like stories. There's always books from new authors that I will feature at the beginning of the episodes, and the links are in the description. Or there's my books. You can check out the Creepypasta Collection Volume 1 and Volume 2, and they're linked in the description down below, and they come from some of the greatest authors I've worked with throughout the entirety of my career. Especially, I wanted to give a big thank you to Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Mr. Thud, Ken Lando Higuchi, Champinsky, Bobby Carmen, Nico Kao, Tristan Pelton, Chase Burnett, Deanna Krauss, King Hades F13, Unknown Nobody, Joshua McMeekin, Michael Scarborough, Kazan, this is my real name, no shit, Jason VB Wilson, Infernal One, Little Wolf Gaming, Jimbo the Hutt, Caspian, Jordan Nels, Hades Nephew, Jordan Wayne Deckart, Randy Lipe, Ann Sharon, Acid System, Mike Bullock, Prozac and Pancake Appreciation Society, Brian Ark, Cryptic Nightmares, Shadow Morningstar, Someone You Love, S Man, Kieran the Law, Thomas Burgett, Liam Newman, Sky Harbor, Caleb Dougal, Nina Smith, Rafael Rodriguez, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Storm Crow, Daniel Paulson, and Corey X. Kenshin. Thank you guys so much for being supporters on Patreon. You guys are seriously the MVPs as well as everybody who's listed down there in the description down below. I hope all of you have enjoyed the stories with me and sweet dreams. <laughs>